what nobody's really talking about is the fact that in the coming decades, there are going to be large populations who simply will not be able to adapt. They're going to have to move. I'm Raj Kumar, and you're in the DevX Book Club. Maybe you're a global development nerd like me. Maybe you work at the UN or at an NGO. Or maybe you're just excited to hear from some of the world's leading authors on the most important issues of the day. Either way, you're in the right place. Grab a snack, get a comfortable seat, and don't worry if you haven't read the book. You're very much welcome. Get ready for our discussion. Our first book club author is Gaia Vince, whose most recent book, Nomad Century, is a sharp, unflinching look at humanity's future once climate change forces billions, that's billions of us with an S, to migrate. It's been described as terrifying, brilliant, and as author Mary Roach put it, the most important book I imagine I'll ever read. Gaia is a science writer and broadcaster exploring the interplay between human systems and the planetary environment. She's an honorary senior research fellow at the Anthropocene Institute at University College London and a regular host of BBC Inside Science. And her first book, Adventures in the Anthropocene, won the Royal Society Science Book of the Year Prize. Gaia, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Hello. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me on. The book is fantastic. I'm so excited to dive into it, but maybe we can just start with you. Um, just tell us a little bit more about you and and how you got excited to write about what is, again, as we'll hear in a little while, a pretty dramatic view of what's coming and what the world needs to do about it. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a subject that I've been um, sort of embedded in, I suppose, for the last more than a decade. Um, I, really, I, I, I really started getting interested in how our environment is affecting human populations and human society. Uh, when I was I was news editor at the journal Nature, and so I was getting lots of reports coming in from all around the world, papers showing how our hydrological systems are changing, how species are going extinct, um, how new diseases are springing up in um, human populations in various places. And I realised that there was one thing that was linking all of that, and that was the way that we were behaving in terms of the Earth systems. We were pushing the Earth systems into a new um, a new geological epoch, which um, which geologists are calling the Anthropocene, the age dominated by humans. Um, and so I, I went around the world to research that. Um, I spent two and a half years in the end, uh, mainly in the global south, um, through Asia, Africa, Latin America, um, and you know Australia, North America, Europe. And I, I drew those experiences together, um, the interviews I'd done and the research I'd found um, with people who were really living on the edge of environmental change. And that was um, at least a decade ago now. And, you know, at the time, the global conversation, certainly among leaders, was very much about um you know, should we take climate change seriously? It will happen in the future if we don't mitigate, if we don't reduce our emissions. And I was sort of banging on the door saying, it's already happening. Look, these people are already experiencing it. We do need to mitigate now, but not only that, we need to adapt to these very different conditions. And since I have written, since I wrote that book, um, which was Adventures in the Anthropocene, um, I I realise that the conversation has shifted. People now ex people now accept that um, uh, anthropological, human-driven climate change is underway already. The climate has changed. We are living in a different world. Mitigation is now uh, written into global agreements. Um, the idea that we have to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, all these, uh, all these. Um, this energy transition and, and uh, the the push to change the way human systems are working in order to in order to change our impact on the climate, and we're starting to have that conversation about adaptation as well. You know, we are adapting our um, our energy systems, but what nobody's really talking about is the fact that in the coming decades there are going to be large populations who simply will not be able to adapt. They're going to have to move. And that's that's not happening. So this book was really written out of, it was born out of frustration. I wanted to say, look, we need to talk about this right now 
because this is already happening. Climate change is already a reality. It's inevitable. It's underway already. Um, and it's going to become an increasing problem. We have choices now. We really need to, we need to talk about them. We need to raise these choices um, democratically so that we can make decisions. We'll, we'll get deep into where, what you're talking about and what the implications are, but I'm just curious how the insight came to you. You know, was it a slow growing insight as you met people, migrants themselves, moving out of communities driven by climate change, or was it kind of an aha moment that just hits you that we have to have a new way of looking at migration? How did this book kind of come about in your own mind first before it ended up on the page? Yeah, well, it was a bit of both. So, I mean, obviously, I've, I've met a lot of climate migrants. Um, there are huge numbers of depopulated villages um, across, well, across South America, across, um, you know, the Andes. And most of the villages in the Andes uh, have lost large numbers of people because of repeated drought, glacial melt, um, agricultural lives being impossible now. Um, and, you know, you find those people in the slums of the cities um, where, you know, a, a general sort of urban migration has been accelerated um, in recent decades because of various reasons. I mean, climate change is a threat multiplier. It's There are many reasons pushing people to migrate. But also, and for my last book, actually, um, Transcendence, I I looked at the human story and how we became this creature that changed our planet. You know, we're, we're a, essentially another African ape. How on earth did we become this global species that is dispersed everywhere, um, that is capable through its networks, through its technology transfer, cultural transfer, this um, incredible species that has changed our planet. And I realised that a large part of that is, is through our migrations, through migrations of ourselves, of our resources, of our ideas. Um, and then, you know, I, I looked at what the situation was, where the conversation was nationally, where it was internationally. We're talking about, you know, um, trying to limit um, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. I mean, I actually don't know any serious researchers who think that's that's feasible. Where where are we now? You, you mentioned in the book, but already, where are we? Yeah, we're somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 degrees above the pre-industrial average at the moment. We're going to exceed 1.5 degrees probably in the next six years. You know that brings with it a lot of a lot of dangerous conditions for for our species. So you know, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. What they do is they trap the sun's energy. They trap the sun's heat in the atmosphere, and that extra energy drives these um, these severe storms, these heat waves that sit for a long time over regions, and um, and also cold spells. So these kind of extreme weathers. Um, it drives, you know, uh, larger storms and sea level rise combined to um, erode coastlines to make living in various places much more dangerous. You get these flash floods. And what's happening is that you get these these back to back extreme events um, which don't leave populations, don't leave um, communities enough time to um to, to recover from each one before they're hit with another one. So so their resilience is hit. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the sort of thing which which makes um, displacement inevitable and means that people, they can't recover and return quite often and certainly not in the same way. You know, there's a passage from your book I want to read because to me it kind of, it, it's sort of the underlying theme of the book. Um, I feel like you're trying to show people that there has always been change in human populations and there is more change coming and that sometimes it's hard for us to accept that there's that change. Here's, here's the passage. This century is all change. The coming decades of environmental change will additionally wreak their own social sociopolitical disturbances with disruptions to food availability and other significant challenges. So when looking at this future, the baseline shouldn't be thought of as your current life as lived today. The comparison rather is between your future city embroiled in climate adaptive infrastructure changes, a hotter environment with flash floods, more violent storms, poor food availability, a shrunken workforce with little elderly care, a social environment of fear with increased conflict, terrorism, famine, and death broadcast to your screens from the global south, 
or far less of this misery, but many more foreign people living in denser cities. And so it seems to me what you're trying to do is lay out for us a choice. Um, you know, t talk to us a little bit about what you think is coming. You seem to suggest that these back-to-back -back crises that we're seeing now already will get worse and that it will force people to move. And that in fact, entire large areas of the planet where currently billions of people live will simply be uninhabitable. You know, the case is really compelling in the book, but maybe just talk us through how you've come to the conclusion that that's, that's really the likely future we're headed toward. Yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, um, you know, at 1.2 to 1.3 degrees above the pre-industrial average, we saw um, last year, 3 million people displaced in the United States. There were 33 million people displaced in just um, a couple of weeks in Pakistan. Um, this is going to continue. So, I mean, if you look at the United States at the moment, the West Coast is um, almost continuously facing one disaster after another, whether it's wildfires, whether it's drought, whether it's um, these severe windstorms in the East Coast, there's um, uh, flooding, uh, the, you know, the, all sorts of um, disasters. And that's a very wealthy country, which um, is best able to adapt to a lot of these changes. Um, the extremely hot zones, if you see those mapped um, and modelled by climate scientists over um, the century, at the moment, extremely hot zones cover about 1% of the Earth's land surface. By 2070, it will be 20% of the Earth's land surface. And that's home to today about a third of the world's population. All right. We've got 8 billion people living on the world in the world today. By 2050, that will be um, somewhere between 9 and 10 billion. That's an awful lot of people who are living in places which for much of the year will be unlivable. Now, you know. When you when you look ahead and try and predict how many people will have to migrate, there are so many variables in all of that. Of course, when you look ahead, there are so many variables anyway. The Earth systems are actually almost the least variable of these um, of these situations. We kind of know a lot of the trajectories w which we will be following by 2050 um, in terms of heat, flood. Um, fire, um, drought, all of these risk factors. But, you know, how much adaptation are we going to do? Um, how much, uh, you know, how how much um, are we going to, you know, help those people move? Um, it, it, there are places which today are unlivable. If you look at, say, Qatar or Dubai, these are essentially unlivable for most of the year. And yet, you know, they do support populations, uh, wealthy populations that live in completely artificial environments and crucially, they're small populations. And that's because they have to have everything brought into them. They have their artificial environment, they have all their food brought in, all their water brought in, e everything. And, um, you know, they live in essentially an air conditioned shopping mall. And, you know, that works for a small population and small populations like that, I have no doubt through um, through the century will continue pers to persist. But then if you look at a city like Mumbai, that's 22 million people, 9 million of whom are living in slum housing. They're living in concrete boxes with a metal roof and temperatures there are already um, some 8 to 10 degrees above the temperature in Mumbai city proper. So, you know, when the temperature when the temperature rises, they will have um, they will have air conditioning in, in some of the big office blocks, the swanky hotels, and so on. And you know, as soon as they're as soon as they're switched on, of course, there's um, huge power outages everywhere, and they run on generators. Now, you know, as the temperature rises, are all of these little boxes going to be given their own aircon units? You know, how on earth would we power that? How would that work? I mean, you know, even the logistics of cooling the air is it's just not it's just not possible for that many people. And I imagine the pushback you get for most people is kind of the optimistic view about innovation and technology that sure, the planet will be warming you know, we'll be moving away from fossil fuels as quickly as we can. We'll therefore mitigate some of that warming. And then in terms of adaptation, there will be new technologies for 
you know, energy generation and air conditioning units and, you know, other other tools that will allow whole swaths of the planet to remain inhabitable because that's got to be easier than moving hundreds of millions or even billions of people. What do you say to that view? To a certain extent, it's true, right? Or ev whenever we have ever faced any um, environmental problem or any other problem throughout our two to three hundred year, hundred thousand year history of our species, we have used all of our human tools and they are technology and social tools. They're vo both very important. And um, yes, of course, it's only because of technology that people can live in a lot of these places um, that, are, that should be uninhabitable. People live in the Arctic, they live in the desert, they live in um, you know wetlands and rainforests. They shouldn't be able to live there. Other, other ape species cannot live in this multitudinous environment, but we can and we do that because we adapt. We adapt our environment and we adapt our, ourselves using technology. Um, and that will be continue to be a tool. Um, but there are limitations, right? And one of the limitations is, you know, how many people can live in those situations? You know, we can, yes, we can call and create a completely new environment and we can do that for ourselves, for our crops, for all sorts of um, things. And it takes energy. And yes, energy, once we've finished this transition um, to renewables, energy could well become extremely abundant and extremely cheap. And that would be amazing and it would solve enormous numbers of social and technological problems that we currently face today. Um, huge inequality that we face um, across the globe, um, a lot of that is driven through unequal access to energy. So that will make things a lot better. Um, but in terms of the large numbers of people that we have and the livelihoods that we would like to live, you know, we're not, we, we're not happy just living in, um, you know, uh, a little um, a factory where everybody has a little kind of aircon room, and we stay in that little room, and it's all great um, for us. That's not that's not that doesn't give us hum human purpose. It doesn't give us um, pleasure. It doesn't give us a livelihood that's worth looking forward to. Um, we live in social situations. We like to go outside. Um, people are going to have to move to places that are. And more habitable for for our species. We're a mammal, right? We need to regulate our body temperature, um, otherwise we don't survive. We need access to fresh water. We need access to um, cool temperatures, essentially, to breathe. You know, if a temperature if the temperature gets um, too hot and it's too humid, we suffer from heat stress. The people that live um, and work in Qatar and Dubai and and the, these um, unlivable places that are doing outside labour. Um, in construction industry or whatever, we know what happens to them, right? They die in much greater numbers. They um, die of heat stress. They have uh, kidney failure, um, all sorts of other diseases. So um, it's not healthy to live like that. And in places um, where the conditions are already like that, people are, you know, farmers are farming at night wearing head torches because it's cooler. That's not living. So um, technology... Technology can potentially cool um, cool our atmosphere, but that again, you know, we can use geoengineering um, solutions. We could use um, all sorts of there are there are ways of bringing the temperature down, but none of this is easy, right? That also involves enormous global uh, gro global agreements, global um, negotiations, and. You know, just as mass migration does, just as uh, climate mitigation does, none of this is easy. Um, so let's start talking about them. Let's start because I've got no doubt that um, in the coming decades we will be using geoengineering to reduce global temperatures. But I would much rather that that was happening by means of um, a well discussed democratic agreement between states, between peoples where um, communities that are negatively affected are, um, um, are compensated, where there is an acknowledgement um, that we, are, we have limitations to how we do it and there are agreements and there are processes, rather than you know, um, states deciding unilaterally that this is an emergency situation and they're just going to deploy it. 
The world is facing an unprecedented global food crisis. Here at DevEx, we're following the state of food insecurity around the world and the solutions that are needed to overcome it. I'm Teresa Welsh, senior reporter, and I'm also the author of DevEx Dish, a free weekly newsletter bringing you a comprehensive look at everything that matters in the world of food. Each Wednesday, DevX Dish will be your guide through the interlocking policy, infrastructure, climate, agriculture, nutrition, and human rights issues remaking the way food is grown and distributed. Visit devx.com slash newsletters to subscribe and get your weekly update on the race for a sustainable global food system. You mentioned before how especially in the Andean region, South America, you can already see it. I spend a lot of time there and I see it too. Rural people have been forced because of climate changes, less fresh water and drier conditions to leave the mountainous rural areas and to come to cities. In the richer world, you see a bit of the opposite. You know, you talk about how in the U.S., the South, states like Florida might become uninhabitable, but more people are moving there now more people are currently migrating to these hotter climates. And I imagine they're doing it because they they feel like, well, with relatively cheap energy and with air conditioning and modern construction, and we can survive here. Um, they don't have to worry so much and they're not thinking. So there's even people moving into these coastal communities where, where the water is still rising. You, but you make the case that you think this is kind of temporary. And you even talk about New York City and say how the plans to build a seawall, a U-shaped seawall around the island of Manhattan could work at some level, but even then might leave half of the island of Manhattan underwater. Um, just take us through this mentality, because you know, these are presumably smart, educated people who are familiar with climate and yet are doing something quite opposite from what you're expecting maybe they should do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is what I mean when, um, you know, when we when we model ahead looking at Earth systems, there are parameters. The modeling is complicated. It's very, very complex. And um, of course, but, you know, we can we can pretty much plot out what various scenarios mean in terms of temperature rise and, and so on. Um, when it comes to human behavior and human societies, it's a lot more complex because people are driven um, by motivations beyond um, having enough water, having a safe place to live, um, uh, enough food, sex, right? Which is what drives most species. Um, humans are driven by all sorts of other uh, motivations. And yes, I think, first of all, that even if people intellectually understand the threat of um, climate change, Emotionally, it's much harder to believe that the world has massively changed. I think there are reckonings that come every now and again. If it's your community that's affected year after year by not being able to open their windows because of smoke from wildfires, you know, that's really unpleasant. That happened, you know, after a while, people start thinking, actually, do I want to live here? Um, you know, when they're flooded out year after year, that's another um, that's another problem. So, you know, in absence of these of these kind of unbearable situations, it takes a bit of time. But, you know, we're also driven by financial concerns and uh, the insurance industry is a lot better at deciding what is risky and what is not. And places like that are just going to become too expensive to insure. So people, you know, people won't be able to buy property, by farmland, by businesses um, on flood, you know, where there's a flood risk, where there's fire risk, where there's um, risk that they won't have access to enough water, all of those things. And the, the worry actually is that um, people will end up being trapped in these places, unable to sell their properties um, and unable to move um, to safer locations because they've left it too late um, because no one's going to want to buy somewhere that's um, a massive flood risk and is uninsurable. Um, and so that's where government policy really needs to help this. You know, movement is hard. It is hard to migrate. You know, we live entirely dependent on other people. We are a very hyper-social species. That is the key to our success as a species. We rely on this network, not just our um, blood relatives, um, but complete strangers to support everything we do. And 
to leave that network, to leave that um, ability to know where you can get someone to look after your kids, someone who can check in on your parents, um, who can um, help you find the job that you need, who can, um, you know, where, where you can find um, work, um, people who speak your language, all of that, and, and where you have history and where you feel that you belong, to leave all that is a wrench and it's very difficult. And for many people, many people who find themselves in climate um, disasters actually already know that they shouldn't be living there, but they, you know, they didn't want to leave. You know, people who are living in the Keys right now, they're not living in complete ignorance. They know that they're being flooded, but they don't want to leave because that's where their home is. That's where their family is. And when you're forced to leave, when you have the you know, when you when you have to move somewhere where you don't know anybody, where you might not be able to get a job straight away, where you you're very poor because your entire like wealth is held in the land that you did have, um, you know, where you may um, face huge amounts of prejudice because of your skin color, because of your accent, because of your um, religion or the clothes you wear or whatever. It's it's a really hard decision to make, and if we're going to help people to adapt by moving, we have to make that easier. I mean, what you're imagining, you know, you're talking, for example, in the book about how many of the cities and countries in the global north are aging very quickly. Uh, you know, the fertility rates are very low and they're going to need young workers. And, and what you just said now, you could imagine young Nigerians, for example, 17, 18, 19, university age, instead of going to university in their country, making the decision to move north go to the university in the UK and and there become part of a future workforce that that would be needed. And, and you can see the logic in that, of course, but kind of similar to what I said about people moving to places of greater danger in some parts of the world right now, it feels like governments are moving in the opposite direction of that vision. They're, they're building walls, they're putting up more barriers to migration than ever. And the politics of migration have gotten worse, not better even as you're calling for governments to kind of change their perspective on this. Do you think that there will be some sort of a tipping point where the politics will shift in and of themselves naturally? Because if you look at sort of the science fiction films and literature around this, it, it seems to go in the other direction, right? Of more walls, of more, of more barriers, um, of the people who have everything, the technology, the wealth, walling themselves in from you know, the, the masses who are trying to get there. How, how do you think this might actually play out? Well, I think that's really interesting that you brought up science fiction, because I think when we do think of the future, um, we have so many examples of the dystopian, um, devastating future. But it, isn't, it, isn't it just as easy and just as um, helpful, perhaps more helpful, to think of a positive future? I mean, really, when I wrote this book, I wanted to say at the moment, what's happening is we're not imagining the future at all, really. Um, and when we do imagine it, it's really awful. So as a result, we're kind of, you know, we're making that mental choice not to think about it and just going along with the day to day. And actually, we're facing huge numbers of crises. It's not good enough to do that anymore. We need to have a vision of a future that we want, a livable future that we want. And ideally, that's something that we've discussed and we've agreed um, democratically a path, you know, a vision that we we want. And then we set out the steps um, to get there because it isn't necessarily terrible, the future. You know, it's very easy to just sort of um, to, to go down that route because it's, you know, it's quite compelling from a science fiction novel. Everybody likes a catastrophe, but actually, you know, it could be better. Well, at the moment, we live with, you know, huge amounts of environmental degradation. Um, people live with appalling, appalling injustice, um, you know, no access to energy, to um, clean water, all sorts of, um, you know, we, we're not living in the ideal world at the moment. We can imagine better as well as worse. And, you know, better is within our reach. At the moment, we do have many choices. And, you know, if we look at we are, you know, as you say, there, there is there is a lot of um, anti-migrant sentiment out there in leadership. Um, we we have been living through um, really quite a a sort of a surge in populist leaders, and 
and inadequate, really inadequate leaders, not visionary people. You were talking about a tipping point in terms of the uh, demographic crisis that we're facing, where we're, you know, we're not having enough babies in many parts of the world to support our aging population. And that is a real problem. Um, many places around the world have, have got uh, really rapidly shrinking populations and huge, important uh, labour force shortages, some of which has been caused by you know, poor handling of the pandemic leading to um, long COVID and, and disability. So people can't work and can't rejoin the um, the workforce. Um, even in these countries, you know, the <laughs> we may see the government saying, you know, with one hand, turn back the boats, so send them back to Mexico, whatever the um, populist rhetoric is. At the same time, they're sort of secretly going, come in, come in. We need, you know, farm labourers, hospitality workers, nurses, um, aged care workers. We need, you know, we haven't got enough workers, of course, and that's going to reach a tipping point. But I think it's also really interesting to note that, um, you know, where I live in Britain, we've obviously had this um, a lot of conversations nationally about immigration, that the Brexit um, uh, decision was largely based on um, a, a, a campaign led by fear of migration, fear of immigration. Um, you know, that decision was um, some years ago now. And if you look at uh, where we are in terms of our leadership, we have um, a Home Secretary, which is um, trying to, which is prioritising uh, uh, limiting asylum seekers' ability to reach British shores. It's putting in place strategies to send people to Rwanda, which is just kind of unbelievable, actually. I mean, it's completely illogical and unworkable, and it makes no sense from uh, any perspective at all. Um, but, if you look at surveys of the British population, you find some of the lowest levels of xenophobia globally. So acceptance of immigrants is at an all time high. Basically, the, the general public is in a completely different place from the leadership. And so when it comes to tipping points in, um, in this conversation, in this, in this um, anti-migrant narrative, I think we're pretty close in Britain and in Europe generally we will be. And that will be driven by two things. First of all, the amount of migrants that we have at the moment, the number of people um, is pretty small, that migration is going to grow. And soon there will be a pragmatic acceptance that it's not possible to just turn people back. We have to have ways of managing it. We have to have fair processes and there has to be a um, a, a system. At the moment, it's broken. This whole migration system is broken. It's, you know, there are, it's, um, it, it's not working for anybody. And the other thing is um, in terms of economies, you know, European economies, American economies, they all rely on immigration and to an increasing extent. If you look at Canada, it has a national policy to treble its population over the coming decades. And, you know, it wants to become an, an ep economic powerhouse. And it's a very lucky country in terms of its position geographically on the globe. So that's perfectly possible. You know, when you think about those attitudinal changes, and, and Canada might be the best example, and you talk about it in the book, um, that they're already there in some ways, it's going to be countries like Canada, like the United States. You talk about Alaska being a key place for people to migrate, um, some of the northern parts of the U.S., the Great Lakes region. You talk about Scotland and Iceland, and you talk about the Nordic countries, and especially Russia, which could have large numbers of Chinese migrants, perhaps. It is going to take a totally different attitude for people living in those countries today to envision building many new cities that are not just a small minority of migrants, but that are filled with migrants, that are far more migrants from other places than maybe the native-born people of those countries. It's quite, a, it's quite a significant attitudinal shift that's required for us to get to this more positive vision that you're imagining we could could get to. Yeah, and it's going to take, it's going to be a huge upheaval, whatever this century, and it's going to take um, investment, it's going to take financial investment, making sure that, you know, uh, that we have adequate funds for 
um, healthcare provision, for education, for housing, all of infrastructure, but also social investment. And that's what's been lacking um, a lot. So that investment in really um, developing an inclusive idea of what nationhood means that it isn't based on some sort of ethno-nationalism, right? Which is anyway biologically nonsense. There is no kind of pure-blooded person from anywhere. Um, we are all a, a mix, a mixture, a mishmash um, from all sorts of different things, and we're not all. We're not it's sort of one unique identity. We don't. We don't hold. We can hold multitudes in our head. We can be, you know. Um, Indian Canadian as well as you know so we can as well as someone who lives in Toronto or um, someone who is a banker but also um, loves the opera you know we can hold all sorts of different ideas and identities in our head and one does not diminish the other um, there will be conflicts but these can be resolved like multi-ethnic um, societies work very well they're the most productive societies on on earth they're called cities right cities are are built from immigration. That's that is how they exist. It's people coming from other places in the country or from overseas um, who build those cities. Um, many of the societies, like the United States, is is created really in the last century or so by immigration, by people from all over the world. You know. Um, finding this uh, common sort of identity and speaking the same language as well as multiple other languages and creating this idea of a nation. And it is an idea. It's just an idea. Um, we can do it again, um, but we need to, I think we need to do it deliberately this time, right? Not by accident, not by conflict, not by, um, you know, uh, colonization, but by by negotiation, by um, planning, because we are facing all of us wherever we live this um, this global earth system challenge to our species and to our societies. And you know, none of us can afford for another country to disappear or to go completely. You know, if if there are endless um, power outages, uh, droughts, famine in, say, China, that doesn't, it doesn't mean we're unaffected in France or Britain or the United States. We're all connected. That affects our economy. It affects our food supplies. We, we've had that huge lesson through the pandemic. Um, you know, we're all affected. And, and when it comes to very fast global change, you know, anything's possible. Look how quickly um, people responded by self um, self-isolating at home, staying at home. Um, that was incredible. And we didn't do it because the government was outside with a gun at our door. You know, we did it by collective um, acceptance and acknowledgement of the threat and an, a collective agreement to behave in a certain way to limit the danger. And I think it will, um, it will happen that way, but we need to take the steps. You talk in the book about the nation state as a relatively recent concept and how even when countries like France and Italy were first conceived that only small percentages of the population spoke the native language and and you do a great job I think showing that nation states can are recent and can sh shift and change and that cities are maybe been around a lot longer and they will be key to the future and then then you make a point about the need for a stronger kind of global governance structure and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that you talk about maybe the United Nations having much more power or some new agency that can can really govern this idea of global migration. What are you envisioning there? I mean, the United Nations, you know, it, it's it's not having a, a particularly good time in terms of PR. There have been all sorts of um, times where it has, should I say, fallen short. Um, but at the moment, you know, we face these, these global crises. Um, and it's our best, you know, it's our, it's our, it's our best um, sort of institution, I guess, um, to deal with some of these problems. If you look at um, the, the COP negotiations for climate, right, I mean, I'd be the first to criticise how that's gone. You know, it's taken decades um, to get to some sort of agreement. We're going far too slowly um, and, you know, that's why we're in this huge mess. 
But I think it's really interesting that there is a negotiation set up where every country, no matter how big, no matter how tiny, has a seat at that table. And that's really important. And not only um, have they got a seat, but they have they have influence. And I think we're seeing a shift change in how responsibilities and um, and you know the injustice is being dealt with globally by different nations. So. For the first time last November in in 2022, there was an acceptance that wealthy countries should pay for losses and damages incurred by climate change um, to poorer countries. Now that, you know, might not seem like much, but that is a huge, huge step change. You know, it's not so long ago that many of these countries almost thought it was their divine right to impose their rule on on uh, these nations. And now they're accepting that um, something that not even they did, but their ancestors did, because the um, the pollution that we're, we're producing now will affect future generations. What we're experiencing now was um, the, uh, the is the effect of the pollution our uh, parents, grandparents really produced. Um, you know, so there is an acceptance that that has an unequal impact and that we should, you know, even if the word compensate is not directly being used, that we we have a responsibility for people who are poorer and who are receiving more impacts. And that is really interesting, I think. I think there is a change going on globally in um in the morality around this. And um, that will affect, you know, where people live. We've also got the law of the sea, which is currently being um, negotiated right now around, you know, who has the right to exploit, you know, say uh, a a new sea urchin that proves to um, have cancer solving potential, you know, would it just be big pharma in, in the US or would, the people of the you know small island state get to benefit and that's being negotiated now so i think it's i think there is this new this new idea of um a global ethics which which is which is starting to be legislated for and i think it will have direct impact and you know when we talk about the mass movement of people what we're talking about if you zoom out really zoom out and have a look at our planet this this kind of blue sphere beautiful sphere the only form of life in the universe and it's got this one species which is dispersed everywhere this one ape everywhere it's built its cities you know these little pathetic lego things that can be washed away by storms and you know um landslides and so on and it lives everywhere and then you apply heat to that and look where the heat is and it's in this big you know by mid century this huge band around the tropics um coastlines become um pretty dangerous, river deltas, where major cities are, where most people live, really dangerous. And then you find these strips of land where, you know, everywhere is affected by climate change, but the impacts are much less in the far north, those lands in the far north, and they're changing rapidly, so rapidly, like some of the fastest change in the planet is happening in the Arctic right now. Um, You know, what would you do, right? You would move those people to safety. And of course, you know, if they're little stick people and you're some sort of huge god, you can do that. But, um, you know, we are trapped, of course, in these um, social political systems and we can't move like that. So I think we need a global body, a global agency to help manage how people can move and to start thinking about this, um, this process. You know, maybe it will just be hundreds of millions. Maybe it will be billions. We don't know, but let's start planning for it. You know, we had a question come in from one of our readers about sort of what this means to you personally. You mentioned in the book uh, as a mom that you were kind of panicked, Googling for, should we move to Canada? You know, what, what do we do? How has the realizations that you've come to in writing the book, how have they actually affected the kind of personal choices you're making about where to live, where to have your kids educated, what they might end up doing? 
How do you how how are you thinking about that personally? Yeah, well, I mean, it's true. You know, if I we moved uh, we moved home. Um, well, I guess five six years ago, and we chose somewhere that was on top of a hill rather than at the bottom of a hill for reasons of flood, right? Because because that's going to be an increasing problem in London. Um, but in terms of the future, my children are seven and um, nine, ten actually, just turned ten. <laughs> He'd be very upset if I called him nine. Um, and when I think about their future, you know, do I want them conscripted into an army um, to fight um, Bangladeshi migrants or Nigerian migrants? You know, I would much rather that they were living in denser um, cities with a Bangladeshi neighbour and a Nigerian neighbour. That's a much more positive outcome for me. Um, so yeah, of course I do, I do worry, um, about their future and I worry about it because, um, in a lot of talks that I've given and in a lot of, um, public events, it is increasingly the young people who seem to feel the, um, the gravity of what we're facing. Um, and they feel it in quite a panicked anxiety driven way, which is awful. It's awful that we've left them with that, you know? Um, and this is a generational thing. If we if we talk about, for example, the reluctance over immigration, it is the older generation, actually, who are much more um, fearful of migrants. The younger generation are much, much more accepting. They've grown up in schools and neighbourhoods where people look different from each other. They might have different accents. They're not afraid of this. These are their school friends or their school friends' parents or, you know, it's not a, it's not such a big deal um, in the way that it, it was for their, for the older generation. So this is going to change. I just think we need to do it faster. You know, I mentioned earlier um, science fiction movies and how dystopian they can be. There's also a genre of science fiction movies that are about alien invasions that are actually much more utopian, that talk about the planet coming together and finding some common approach. And, and I hope people reading this book and I hope the conversation you're trying to spark leads to that kind of a realization that we are all in this together. Um, it's a, I think there, it's an insightful book in so many ways, really eye-opening. And at least for me, working in global development, one of the key takeaways is just how quickly the context in which we work is shifting. And that even people in our own field who are so awakened to these issues around climate and deal with migration issues every day, that, that even we have to be aware of how much more quickly things are going to shift and, and what that means for those who are dedicated to working on issues like health and education and, and supporting and serving refugees and others. So climate change is largely, um, the, the academic study of it is largely driven by um, earth, earth scientists, so um, physicists, atmospheric chemists and so on, um, who work with modelling and um, they you know, they can see this dramatic change coming. Um, whereas migration studies is driven by social scientists um, who who sort of look back at um, and extrapolate, you know, how migration has occurred in the past. And it is quite slow. And, you know, it there are pushes and pulls and it's, in, and you can see that sort of slightly increasing. But the problem is that these two need to come together. We need to realise that it's not going to be how it was in the past. You know, there's a natural disaster, people move, you know, a large number of people displace, some people go back, some people, you know, what we are facing is unprecedented. We are facing really dramatic earth system changes, which will completely change the social system. And it's hard to, it's hard to imagine such, um, such a big change. Um, but I want us to, you know, I want us to have a vision of a future and and then to choose. We have so many choices. We really do at the moment. But to choose those paths um, consciously and deliberately and go down them with the end in sight of something better um, rather than muddling along. Well, thank you so much, Guy Evans, for the book. Uh, it really is I think an important contribution to the conversation and, and for taking the time to be with us here on the DevX Book Club. It's been fantastic to talk with you. Oh, it's been a massive pleasure, Raj. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Guy Vince is a science writer and broadcaster. You can follow her on Twitter at, at 
Wandering Gaia. Thank you all for joining. If you like the podcast, please share with your friends and give us five stars. And we really do want to hear from you. Please leave your thoughts in the comments or send me a message on Twitter at Raj underscore Debex. To learn what we're reading next, make suggestions for future guests, or submit questions for authors, be sure to sign up for our DevX Book Club mailing list, which you can find in the description of the show wherever you're listening to this. If you care about global development issues and you want the latest news, don't forget to subscribe to the DevX Newswire at the link in the comments, where you'll get the day's top global development breaking news, analysis, and opinion, as well as the date of the next book club. Until then, Do good out there, and thanks for joining.